So welcome to this uh, <laughs> panel discussion on high performance in mobile. Um, as you might know, mobile traffic is said to surpass the of traffic, and in many cases it already has. According to Forbes, uh, mobile traffic is expected to grow to 190 exabytes in the next four years, and it was just 18 exabytes last year. Normal growth expected. And according to WorldPay, uh, the value of mobile transactions is expected to grow to $118 billion. That was also just $15 billion last year. Again, phenomenal growth expected. And uh, if you think of online video, uh, there are different ways in which how you stream to the, to the mobile compared to desktop. And it's been observed that the click-through rate in, in mobile online video is three times higher than desktop. So for a company like Yahoo uh, uh, and other companies like Yahoo, mobile is just key to, to our growth and key to providing a good user. The mobile technology landscape obviously comes with, uh, with lots of different challenges. There are different operating systems like iOS, Android, uh, different user experience with mobile web, mobile native app, different connectivity speeds with 3G, 4G, and in future 5G. In some some countries <coughs> is already available, I think in Korea. And uh, then uh, we have differences in, in online video. So let me ask a question here. Who either is building something for mobile? Who here is not building something for mobile? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, who here thinks that, uh, out of people who, who are building something for mobile, who thinks that we have the right set of platforms and tools for building high performance mobile applications? Very few hands. Okay. So, uh, to, to exactly answer that question, we have organized this panel today uh, with these experts. And uh, each of these experts is uh, deeply engaged with mobile performance on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so let's let's start with some introductions. I'll, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, Manish. Uh, hi. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, my name is Manish Nakwani. I am the CTO and co-founder of AppPurify. AppPurify has built a mobile optimization platform for uh, iOS and Android devices, uh, which measure uh, the performance of apps um, and mobile web pages uh, continuously across builds in under various uh, user conditions. Manish, you were CEO at Zynga before? Yeah, I used to lead the uh, mobile launch at Zynga, and prior to that, um, I led the team that wrote the operating system for entire Kindle series. Also responsible for uh, building the first Kindle app on uh, iOS and Android. Thank you. Jay? Yes, I'm actually, I'll take this one. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Jay Srinivasan. Um, I'm uh, Manish's co founder, I'm the CEO of AppPurify, um, and as he explained, I think. What we've been exclusively focused on over the last year and a half is this notion of mobile performance. And I'm sure we'll get into this in a bit more detail, but I think about performance as a combination of not just load times, but also on-device uh, on performance as well as stability. So this is something that we've been exclusively focused on. And we have some very strong perspectives on how we think the mobile landscape should evolve. Uh, before. Uh, uh, Purify, I was with, uh, I met Manish and Zynga, where, uh, and by the way, this is where my expertise ends, by the way, because before this I was at Zynga, where I was a revenue product manager, before which I spent several years at McKinsey, before which I did a PhD in microprocessor research. So, I, I have like two years of mobile performance expertise. Yeah, together I think uh, Jay and several patents. I think 40 patents, is that right? Uh, no, so, uh, as part of App Purify, we hold 14 patents. And I alone hold about 34 patents in the area of power management, uh, which is what I built uh, for the Kindle, uh, Kindle series, from Kindle 2 to Kindle Lights, and then uh, the first version of Kindle 5. Right. Uh, well, I guess I... Can you guys hear me? Yes? No? Can I steal that from you? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I guess I already did an introduction. So I work on the Chrome team. Um, maybe relevant, what's relevant to the discussion is um, I spent quite a bit of time working with the standards community. And so if you guys in particular have any wants, asks from the browser, uh, you know, that, that's one of my uh, objectives is to actually go to the community and hear what you guys are feeling pain in or with. Uh, is there new functionality? Is there specific use cases that don't work uh, and all the rest? So I think we'll, we'll get into that a little bit in the discussion. So, uh, really as an item of performance, I think everyone knows them. We need no further introduction. Uh, so, thank you, panelists, for coming here. Uh, let's start with the uh, video. Uh, we often talk about uh, desktop 
versus mobile performance. And uh, here at Yahoo and even outside, we talk about achieving the one second uh, benchmark for performance. So how does that, that one second number apply? Uh, so fundamentally, it's actually uh, no different, right? Like if you, if you make a great fast loading desktop site, it should be a great fast loading mobile site. Uh, whether it's a different site or not is, is a different story. The challenge with mobile is just, it's just harder, uh, primarily because of the latencies. Uh, I think so there's certainly some constraints in bandwidth as well, but increasingly you know, across the United States and elsewhere with things like 4G rolling out, I'm actually very optimistic that, uh, you know, that the bandwidth kind of part of it is kind of going away. Like my, my 4G connection is better than my Comcast at home, which is sad, uh, but that's a different discussion. Uh, the problem with mobile in one second in particular is basically when you look at the analysis of something like 3G, you just have to throw out more than half of that time due to pure network latency. Uh, because you're running, uh, you, know, you have your DNS, TCP, TLS, uh, and all the rest, 500, 600 milliseconds, gone. And then after that, you have to figure out what else can you do, right? So you've shipped uh, 20 kilobytes of data. By the way, you can just ship like a meg of data, right? Like you can get 20, 40 kilobytes of data down to the client. And the question is, what can you do with 20 kilobytes of data? Can you render your page in 20 kilobytes of data? And by the way, you're not really allowed to make many external requests, right? Like that critical path that we just heard about. Uh, you are not uh, fetching jQuery and other things to start rendering that, that page because just parsing jQuery takes on the order of a bloody second on a mobile phone. So uh, those are the challenges that I, I find that we need to kind of fight with, and it's a very challenging problem. So uh, given that challenging problem and uh, the nodes that exist in the industry today, what are some of the obvious things that we can do to optimize? Uh, so obvious things, uh, obviously reducing that latency as much as possible, right? So uh, leveraging CDNs, uh, making sure that you are not inducing extra round trips for whatever reasons, ability to reuse connections, right? You should re-examine all of those things. Like, should I be serving this file from uh, a different host name? Because that's another DNS lookup and all the rest. You should really re-examine that in a mobile context. And then also look at things like, well, uh, could I start um, maybe inlining some of the assets, right? I mean, it's unfortunate that you have to do that. Maybe with something like speedy push, uh, you can actually break that uh, critical path chain and just say, like, here's all the data that you need. Uh, but right now, basically, you know, when we talk about at Google about achieving that one second barrier, we say, hey, you got basically 14 kilobytes, and in that 14 kilobytes of data, you need to give us the critical CSS because that's what you need to render the page. Right, that kind of above the fold content, and also uh, any other, even JavaScript that, that you can push, and that that's a tough, so problem. And the question becomes, and how do you automate that? Can you automate that, and all the rest? So, as an example, uh, the the RSC radio interface itself can induce a few milliseconds to a few seconds of additional latency on mobile. Yep. So. Uh, and, and this is something that, that we have to live with. So how do we optimize the such thing? How do we design an application to counter that additional latency and still provide a good experience to the users? I think you need, we need to educate developers about uh, these new challenges, right? Uh, I think most uh, web developers just uh, think of the network layers that, like we don't actually look under the hood, right? We have no idea. Uh, especially for things like radio. So it turns out uh, to get a good performance on radio or on mobile radio, you basically need to keep it simple. Like if you try, if you try too hard to be clever about, oh, I'll defer this and I'll load this later and I'll load that on demand, you'll basically end up shooting yourself in the foot because the radio has gone idle. Now you need to wake up the radio again. We need to negotiate with the tower. There's all that extra overhead. And once you kind of figure all that out, you're like, okay, basically I need to fetch as much as I can as quickly as possible and then turn off the radio, which, by the way, is also going to help in your energy use, which is a big deal. This is actually one thing that we are not talking about as a web, in the web community at all. There's like zero conversation about energy use. It's a big deal in the app community, in the native app community. I think we will, that has to change. That will change. Uh, it's going to be a painful discussion when we realize that a lot of these so-called patterns that we're doing, things like uh, progressive loading, they actually hurt both latency and energy use on mobile. So yeah, so I wanted to add a little bit on about the RRC states. So the RRC states are different between a 3G radio and a 4G radio. Um, the 3G has multiple states, which is a medium power state. The 4G has a high power and a low power state. 
And what how the what the app needs to do is um, transfer as much data as possible when the radio transitions to a high power state because it's going to be there for a little while. And if it sees no uh, uh, no transfer of traffic, no transfer of data, it's going to eventually go back to the low idle, low power mode. And the reason why it transitions to low power mode is of course to save energy. So I think. Um, what, um, and this is uh, what we did uh, um, at Zynga and prior to that as well, was uh, determine the app characteristics uh, and map it to the radio state and, and exactly point out um, what's the specific HTTP request that were being made by the app that used to wake the radio up. And what would happen is you would wake the radio up but not do much. You're going to go back into idle state but you simply woke up the radio and this could have been done as part of the previous high power state. So that's the sort of correlation that needs to be established. Um, and basically, you need to fix your app at some level in order to make sure you map to the RRC state. Uh, the RRC states uh, vary between carriers as well. And uh, of course, what's going to happen is if you are in a in an area where there are several cell towers, and if the in, if the device is switching or if you're traveling, uh, the RRC states are also going to change. So you, but again, you know, keeping the RRC, keeping the device at a constant location, um, and if the app characteristics can be changed to map the RRC state for a specific carrier that causes a big improvement. And, and the one thing I'd add here, so Ilya talked about web pages, money started talking about apps. So first of all, that that in itself is super important. You gotta understand that you're building, you gotta be thinking about this for both your apps, at, be it a native app, a hybrid app, HTML5 app, or for mobile web pages. The second thing that's common to all of this, which is very specific to mobile, and I completely agree with Ilya, about battery consumption being critical and people not thinking about it, uh, the exact same, uh, you also need to think about all of the other aspects of the device, of device fragmentation that you're thinking about. So, for example, the 80% of what iOS users are on, what devices they're on, or what Android users are on, each of these has a slightly different, uh, uh, slightly different paradigm when it comes to radio power management. Each of these has a, obviously has a different form factor in a lot of cases. Uh, their CPU is different, their memory is different. Basically, there are all these other constraints that are specific to what you can actually do on a mobile web page. So again, you're not in an environment where you have unlimited resources with an unlimited network pipe that you, and so you're just trying to speed up things as much as possible. You're also now constrained by specifically what devices people are on. And my, my favorite example of this, especially when it comes to iOS, is right now at App Purify, we see consistently that everyone is building their apps for an iPhone 5S or a 5C. Guess what, 50% of your users are still on a 4 or a 4S with significantly lower processing power, significantly less memory. And so being very aware of what end users are on and how that's actually going to impact performance is also super critical. I think the big problem here, uh, kind of the elephant in the room, is there's just no good tools. Right, like we talk about energy and talk about Other than radio state. Well, even with a, yeah. do you guys provide visibility into radio states? Yeah, we do provide visibility into radio states. Um, we provide um, so basically. Our market that, but yes. yeah. <laughs> so I, I can go in detail. For example, the radio resource control states for different type of radio: CDMA, EVD, or UMTS, the GSM, um, and actually um, integrating with different baseband stations from Agilent and range networks and so on, but even simulating uh, the data over Wi-Fi to see the impact on them. Okay. But there's a bunch of data that we can collect and provide. So we need to make tools like that be available to developers as they develop it, right? So I, I keep coming back to like the Chrome developer tools seem like, give me this data, and they, and they tell me, I'd love to give you that data, but I need to do low-level plumbing, and you know what, like the Qualcomm chips don't give me this data. And the Android platform doesn't really pipe this data, neither does iOS. And uh, it becomes very hard. So basically, the tools that I'm aware of today are doing simulations. Like AT&T has a pretty good tool, AT&T Aero, which basically runs a, simul a simulator. Right? Like they take a TCP dump and just kind of build a model and tell you, like, here's the states you're transitioning through. Uh, just recently, I saw a tool from Intel, uh, but you know, there's not a lot of mobile phones that run Intel uh, chips at this point. So there's a lot of room for improvement, and I think the first step that we need to do is, frankly, just get better tooling. So if there's one thing that you can do today is like figure out how can I instrument my app to get some energy data. And like, it, it may sound silly, but what we're doing with Chrome today is we're literally taking a bunch of phones, connecting a bunch of wires to them, and you know, that's how we're profiling our stuff because that's the only way to do it. Right. All right. So we will get to those uh, a bit later in detail. Um, so. 
Now let's say uh, you know you talk about the word mobile, mobile things that are users moving. So if, if I if I'm mobile and I'm walking, my connection speed is probably changing from 4G to Wi-Fi, and sometimes there's no connection. Um, and if I'm accessing an application, uh, does it help to employ techniques like HTML5 that cache and other things to account for such conditions when uh, you know, the user moves between the connection speeds and other connections? How do you design for loss of connectivity? I guess there's a couple of different questions in there, right? Uh, one is just variable latency and variable bandwidth. So by, by its very nature, when we're talking about wireless communication, you just have to assume that it's variable everything, right? Right now, I uh, happen to be streaming a, a YouTube video, and then my buddy turns on his laptop and starts streaming a, a Netflix video, and all of a sudden, our bandwidth cut in half, right? Because we share the same channel. Um, so I can control that, you can't control that, that's, that's how it works. Uh, that's why, you know, if we're talking about large transfers, specifically video, this is where you get into the whole uh, variable bitrate streaming and kind of how you deploy that and all the rest. Uh, for apps, uh, I get a lot of questions around, like, how do I estimate my bandwidth? And the short answer is you don't. You send a request and you try to, you know, you hope for the best. Uh, there is no API in the browser today uh, that will tell you what is your bandwidth. Uh, there's been a lot of pushback. There's been a lot of discussion around it. There's been a lot of pushback from the implementers basically saying, look, we don't have a good way to estimate it, so anything we give you is going to be just wrong. And then there's the case of just outright you're disconnected. And the answer there is yes, you need to deal with that. We need to think about it. It's a painful use case, right? Like, uh, think about the experience of, I don't know, you jump on a train, uh, you're going in a tunnel, and uh, now you can you know, refresh your stream or get the latest news and all the rest. That does work for a lot of native apps, right? Because uh, not because they've actually done such a great job of dealing with offline, it's just that they've approached the problem from a different perspective. They tend to build from offline first, and then they add online interactivity. So they kind of get that offline behavior, if you will, whereas a lot of web apps go from the other direction. They're always connected, and then they start thinking about offline. I think we need to shift our thinking kind of in that mode as well. The one thing I add here is, uh, again, now thinking about it from the app maker's perspective, and uh, a, uh, a app from Manish in my history uh, is a super popular game on Facebook, uh, uh, a company ported into uh, to mobile. And what they found was, so this game took six months to build. It was a native app, a uh, huge design team, huge uh, development team, large testing team, et cetera. They built this app, shipped it, and it disappeared from the app store, spent a bunch of money on marketing, and it disappeared from the app store in less than two weeks. And the reason that it did do that was uh, there was, uh, so the first time user experience of the app, and this is a game, so the first time user experience is the most critical thing. You either engage someone in that first time user experience, or they're never going to come back to the game. So it's super critical. And what happened was between steps three and four, so within the first five minutes of this first time user experience, anybody that was on at and three bars or below, there was, there was insufficient bandwidth and there was some sort of network call that was being made and it was a synchronous call and it wasn't handled well on the app side. And so what would happen is the iOS watchdog would kill the app. So there was a situation where you spent six months, huge amounts of time building an app and then Anybody on AT&T 3 bars, and this was in 2011 where everyone was on AT&T 3 bars. So basically, anybody in that situation, the first time they download this game would cause it to crash. They're never going to come back to it again. My point here, assume you don't have network connectivity and make sure everything works. So again, assume the worst case when it comes to the network and then start fixing stuff. So don't build just in an offline world. Assume that that's what your situation is always going to be. And then essentially add in your network functionality, especially on the app side. And I would like to add something here. I believe that the user at the end of the day does understand, given that uh, the bars appear on the top of the device, that, that the user is in a poor signal condition. What's important is that the app doesn't crash or app doesn't lose state. That's very important. Once your app starts crashing, that basically gets you poor reviews, and that's where the user is going to be turned off. So it's understood that the data transfer is going to be weak. It's understood that the signal is weak and the app cannot perform what it's supposed to. By the end of the day, if the app crashes, that's going to be a big issue. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of UX concerns here as well, right? I think a lot of web apps approach uh, the problem from kind of a synchronous, interactive, you click a button, I send a request, I wait for the response, I give you the data uh, approach, which works fine, generally speaking, when you're on Wi-Fi or other things. Uh, but you know, once we add something like, oh, I need to start up my radio, 
and there's a negotiation there and there's extra round trips, you end up staring at that button for a second and now it feels broken. There's actually nothing broken, it's just the way it works. Uh, so you need to, like, when I talk to design teams, I actually tell them, like, on mobile, you have to assume that you need to decouple your UX from your network, right? I click a button, give me the response immediately. Tell me that you're working, like, start a spinner or something, right? Don't force a synchronous, like, HTTP request in the background, which is what a lot of sites do. So just even talking to your design team and saying, look, it isn't, like, I'm going to try my best to make the network go as fast as I can, but sometimes I just can't. Right? So you have to design these interactions such that, and that may mean changing your UI in a fundamental way. Right. And by the way, so uh, if you look at the web page test tool, this is essentially what's happening with speed curve, right? So think about what needs to be rendered, what you can render immediately to provide some sort of response to the, to the end user, so even for mobile web page. Think about what you can immediately show. You don't have to load everything. Yes, you need to optimize the, the performance. You need to uh, fit as much into as little data as possible, but fake it when you can, right? Like basically right. provide some responsiveness to the customer. All right. Great point, this thanks. Uh, so the next thing uh, I'd like to uh, ask about is uh, the mobile CDN. So CDN typically produces the propagation delay between the user and server. And uh, uh, a lot of tech companies use it, uh, and Campbell also use CDNs. So uh, the question is that uh, is CDN something which is one size fit all? Uh, is it something that applies equally well to desktop and mobile, or uh, does it make sense to have a mobile-specific CD and a mobile-specific optimization for the CD? Do you want to take that? Oof, that's a, that's a big topic. So, um, ideally, no. Um, at, le at least that's my opinion. So, the the trouble uh, that I that I run into when we talk about CDNs and mobile is like, C uh, I often hear the sentiment of CDNs are not nearly as effective or useful for mobile. And when you run the numbers, it actually kind of looks that way, right? Because um, what happens is you have your propagation delay, which is usually what the CDN is supposed to optimize, right? It's like taking your server and caching your content closer to the user. Uh, that's kind of that main value add. The trouble with mobile networks in particular is that last mile, right? So your CDN puts their uh, servers right at the edge of whatever the pop for the, for the mobile network is. But a huge chunk of the latency is inside of the carrier network. For 4G, that's going to be 50 milliseconds. For 3G, it's 150, 200 milliseconds, right? So great, you've cut off 50 milliseconds for a round trip from the east coast to west coast, but now I've got to go 150 milliseconds down to the client. So then the question becomes, well, could you move that node down into the uh, network itself? And a lot of carriers have tried to do this, right? A lot of the AT&T's of the world and others, Verizon's, uh, they've been trying to get into the CDN business. Uh, at least as far as I can tell, well, and specifically for this reason, right? Like if we can move it closer to the edge, closer to even the base station, we, we'll get better performance. Then, pr practically speaking, let's say I'm running my, you know, awesomesite.com, what does that mean? Do I need to go and sign deals with Verizon, AT&T, and every other carrier out there? And that's just impractical, right? So uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, there's been kind of a, a number of initiatives, as far as I can tell, in the CDN community to try and kind of band this together, where they've created deals where basically AT&T or somebody else could come in and kind of peer uh, with other carriers. Of course, recently we had Edgecast acquired by Verizon. So I'm really curious what comes out of that, right? Because uh, Edgecast was actually one of the big um, movers in the space to try and to kind of create a white label solution for a lot of the carriers. I'm not sure if that's still going to exist now that it's Verizon. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but the, ch the challenge there is just that. It, it's moving the content closer to the base stations. And even there, it's not clear if that's a feasible thing to do. You know, I, I do agree with Ilya on this point, but I believe in addition to latency and delay, there's also packet loss, packet jitter, packet duplication, and so on, which is going to happen as your signal quality starts degrading. I feel at some level, uh, someone or some appliance in between has to figure out that the request is coming from a device in a specific signal condition and serve the amount of data which will fit the device, which will fit the network. Or what's going to happen is there's obviously going to be a loss of connection. There's obviously going to be loss of data, loss of synchronization. 
that's going to impact the user, impact the app, and you know, of course, network as well. So I'm curious when you, when you say that, why is that not the concern of the link layer of the carrier network itself? True. Yeah, and that could be somewhere that could be implemented at that level as well. I mean, I, I believe Android does have some have some API calls that could be leveraged uh, inside the app, but that's at an app layer which is way higher and not at the lower layer. Right. Uh, maybe just one curveball to throw into this discussion is um, encryption. So a lot of carriers are deploying these you know, smart middleware, smart middleware optimization boxes and all the rest. And frankly, my experience with a lot of them is that they actually make things worse in a lot of cases uh, because they don't really understand kind of the full implications of introducing these things. And you know, we've actually done tests where we said, look, can you car carve out like a special path for this one application and see what happens? And the latency is better. All right. Uh, so, and then you add encryption into that, and basically the carriers are out of the equation because now I have an encrypted tunnel between the between the phone and the and the server. Agreed. Yeah, I, I believe you're right. I mean, that's definitely going to complicate things. I think at some level, um, having API calls at an OS level is going to help the app, and app developers make smarter decisions when they're fetching content. Uh, and of course, you know, if you look at Android and some of these uh, calls related to the radio, uh, they they're basically events which app developers can actually intercept and figure out what the current signal strength is, and basically vary the amount of data being downloaded, and maybe show something that is pre-cached. But of course, yeah, this. Something which an SDK or a static library already does would be very beneficial. So, um, just something just occurred to me. So, when we said mobile CDN, right, I kind of took it literally as like the CDNs that I think about today. Um, and, and that, it seems like those CDNs should work with the mobile carriers and figure out how to get their, you know, their distribution nodes even further down into the network. And I hope that they will do that. Where I think we could leverage infrastructure a lot more is mobile optimize specific delivery services. Examples of that being things like uh, the Google Cloud Messaging or the iOS push notifications. Uh, but something like push messaging, right, for let's say for an app, what you can do is you can say, look, I want to push this message, these sets of messages to the user, but please don't wake up the phone if they're not currently uh, using the phone. Right? Or please batch, like I'm just going to push a whole lot of notifications and then please batch them for me. And deliver them efficiently. So those kind of middleware services are actually very, very powerful right? because that middleware could actually say, look, the, the, the user just woke up, they're using their phone, so it's efficient for me to actually push a bunch of data to them. Or I can collate this data and all the rest. Uh, for native, we actually have a bunch of services like that, right? Both kind of iOS, Android, and third party that try to obfuscate all the different APIs. I think we can do a lot better on the web. Uh, there's a standard, a bunch of standards that are in the works right now for push messaging, uh, but it's not as fully featured. I think that's something we need to improve. So uh, we spoke about speed before. Uh, uh, to get to this uh, quickly, uh, is there anything in speed which uh, provides uh, uh, mobile specific performance improvement? Again, uh, is it something like CDN where it's um, so, so we covered, I think, a whole bunch, which is uh, reducing round trips is obviously a big deal, right? So being able to use that one connection and just more efficiently multiplex data over it. Uh, there are concerns, and you know, this was brought up around uh, packet loss, for example. So TCP uses packet loss as a signal for congestion. It turns out that you know. It's not even packet loss. It's the variability in the timing of your packet arrival that throws off TCP. So there's been a number of studies where basically you know, there is no packet loss at TCP layer. It's just that the radio layer keeps transmitting data. That adds uh, high jitter into the arrival of packets. TCP throws up its hands and says, like, look, I don't know what's going on. It feels like congestion in the network. Let me just half all of my congestion windows. Um, that's suboptimal. So uh, that's why we're doing things like quick. Uh, with HTTP2 and Speedy, we can do a lot in the browser itself. So previously, if you were to open, well, you can still open, let's say the Chromium code and look at our resource scheduling, it is a mess. Uh, 
uh, in terms of like it's hacks upon hacks upon heuristics of like how do we schedule these resources efficiently? How how do we take this critical path, right? And how do we get this data to the client in the most efficient way? Because we don't actually know. Like, should we open a new connection? What if the previous request comes up? quicker and we can reuse the previous connection. Right? There's all these stupid games. Uh, for example, we hold back images for up to a certain number of seconds or until a certain condition is met. Like, and if you ask me why it's that certain number of seconds, it's like, well, we ran a test a year ago on that, that number of sites and that seems to have been the right number. Right? I mean, it's, it's dumb. Uh, with Speedy, we actually now are ripping all of that out. Right? Like, so uh, last year, uh, we said, no more of these games with Speedy. The moment we discover a resource, we're just going to send it to the server because finally we have things like prioritization. We can actually say, look, I, just, I need this image, but it's a low priority thing. I also need this JavaScript asset, but it's a high priority thing. And then actually the burden becomes on the server to implement this right. So one thing that is actually quite often missed is that uh, when Speedy first shipped, and for example, Nginx implemented Speedy version 2, that was kind of a big deal, got a lot of PR and all the rest. A bunch of people turned it on and were like, hey, it's not actually any faster. What's going on? Right. And the short answer is, and we were also excited at Google, like, awesome, I didn't access Speedy and all the rest. And then we did the test and we're like, oh, you don't actually implement prioritization. I see. Uh, because we just blasted all the requests at them and actually made it worse. Because the server, like, if you think about it, the dynamic resources are usually the critical ones, the most important ones, because they're the ones that, that's their CSS and you know, user-optimized JavaScript and all the rest. Those would take longer. The static assets, like big fat images, would get served by Nginx immediately. So you basically stuff the pipe with all of the irrelevant assets, and then you queue up all of the important things at the end. So <laughs> anyway, lots to do. <laughs> So let me uh, take on this something else. So today both you and I are members of the Proposal for Networking Hands Spectre that I've been working on. And we've exchanged a few emails on use cases for uh, the proposal on networking hands spectra that we're working on. And in fact, I got some use cases from Yahoo and I shared with you before. Uh, so prefetching networking hands uh, essentially the trade-off between the bytes and the user experience and from mobile in the mix you have battery performance there. So what's the right strategy? What's the right uh, way to use I think it's very hard to answer that question in a generic way. Like it really depends on your application, right? So the the, the insights about any sort of speculative optimization on on app side is that. There's a lot of things that we as a browser can do to kind of infer what you're going to do. And in fact, we do a lot of that today. Chrome, for example, has its own set of infrastructure for recording past navigation data, past browsing behavior, past everything. Uh, you know, silly things like you're, you're hovering over this link, let us start pre-connecting uh, to, uh, to this host. All those things save a lot of time. But ultimately, uh, you, when you develop the app, have the intimate knowledge and understanding of the app. Right, like you know that if the user is heading down into the subsection, then perhaps they'll be loading a certain type of content. Right, that's not something we can infer uh, as a third party. If you have those kinds of insights, that's where you should be able to give these hints to the browser to say, look, I think the user is going to do this with high confidence. Uh, so that's what the networking hints proposal is all about. It's like, how can we define or what primitives do we need to provide to you guys to make this meaningful, to make this useful, right? Uh, is a TCP pre-connect a useful hint? Is a pre-render a useful hint? Pre-render is actually a very useful hint, but it's very expensive, right? Because basically it means, let us open a tab in the background and start rendering this. And that consumes a lot of CPU, energy, and everything else. So finding those trade-offs is challenging. Um, yeah, actually, actually, let me add something here. Um, this is out of packing. Uh, so I, I want to go on a tangent here, actually. Uh, so far, we focused on discussion on network, which is, which is a very important factor in the app performance. But also, there's a whole bunch of trans um, made that need to be gathered for the app to perform correctly, which is both on what, basically, both from a CPU standpoint, the power of the device, the memory usage, 
uh, the frames per second and so on, how many apps are running in the background. So while there is a network component that is very important, there's also a client side piece that has to be measured uh, for the app to correctly perform under different conditions. So uh, that brings me to the next question, uh, Manish and Jay, uh, either of you can take this question. Uh, give us a landscape of uh, what exists today, not only in your company, but outside your company as well, in terms of uh, testing mobile performance end to end personally for the mobile web or the mobile app, and what can we expect to see in the future? Sure. So, um, let's see. Okay, so I would say 80% of what we see is very, very, very limited testing on any form of real device or real user condition right now. So the landscape as it exists right now is pretend your laptop is your mobile device, use the simulator or whatever, and figure out what's going on, which is obviously not ideal. So let's talk about where we think things need to go. And I'm going to give you sort of the app purify perspective, but as well as a, a broader perspective. Um, personally, I, we're, we're actually very agnostic to whether apps are going to be a big deal or whether mobile web is going to be a big deal three years from now, right? It's, I think, uh, between Chrome and Safari, things are catching up fast enough that there's going to be, my personal prediction is there's going to be very limited use cases for a true native app, and instead you're really going to be very heavily relying on, on, on the browser. So with that said, the landscape that exists right now is uh, some, tr some tools that allow you to, 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 capture, to capture your network traffic, HTTP or HTTPS, but very little, uh, but very little on the client side. And so, I think a lot of what you're going to have sufficient tools to understand what's happening on the network layer, on the network side. What is missing right now is a, a chunk of tools around the device layer. And so, there are a few things that we see are going to have to happen. One is you're going to have to truly start thinking about the user base and the types of devices that are relevant. So. For example, even in Android, if there are seven different manufacturers, that means they're using seven different radio chips. That means they're using seven different components as part of their as part of their infrastructure. So, first of all, uh, there's going to have to be more tools, and we're already seeing this uh, uh, come, come about. But web page test, for example, super popular tool, obviously for web page performance. You need to start thinking about exactly that on the mobile side as well, right? So number one, you're going to have there are going to be more tools that are actually allowing you to capture device device side data. Now, when you start thinking about the device side, there are probably four primary metrics that we think about. Uh, number one is uh, number one is stability, and the way I see, I, I think Manish and Ali are far more technical than me, so I'm going to give you my business perspective on this. I care more about stability, honestly, than load time, and I'll tell you why. Forty forty. 42% of all poor ratings in the App Store are stability related. They're related to crashes. Something like 7% are related to slow performance. So your users are not going to use you guys because of stability, not first, and then only are they going to worry about network performance. So on the device side of the house, we think about four, four primary metrics. One is the uh, one is uh, stability. Second is UI responsiveness, which more often than not actually translates to CPU performance. So essentially, there's obviously the network layer, but the, one of the strongest correlations we've seen to UI responsiveness, how, how quickly does my phone respond, is basically what's going on in the CPU. The third, obviously, is anything to do with the network, load time, et cetera. And then finally, it's essentially battery and thermal. Now, in the case of, uh, so what we're, going to, what we're seeing as, as things, we think we actually have to address each of these individually. So for example, stability, there are going to be a set of tools around stability. How exactly do you handle poor network conditions or other network or, or other performance constraints, be it um, I have too many apps open in the background or I have, uh, I'm about to enter a subway or um, I just happen to have a really old phone, right? So there's going to be a bunch of tools that start focusing on stability. Another bunch of tools that are going to focus on CPU performance. So essentially, how effectively, if, if it's an HTML5 app or something, how would I, what does my JavaScript look like? How is it actually running? And how much CPU am I taking? And as part of CPU, the corollary there is obviously memory usage as well. And then there's the whole set of network tools that are going to come about. And then finally, there's going to have to be uh, more tools that exist on the battery side. The answer to your question right now, there aren't that many good tools, especially on the device side of the house. App Purify is young. We're two years old. We're a little less than two years old. And we have a lot of the tech in place. But we're trying our best to productize this out as quickly as possible. Um, most of the old guard, as we think about it, in terms of mobile tools are poor ports of PC or web tools to mobile. 
So at best, what they're telling you is uh, is round trip latency, but they're not really giving you any good information on on, on the device side. So there are tools like Perfecto, uh, tools by Perfecto Mobile, Device Anywhere, Sosta. All of these are essentially web tools that you're trying to apply to mobile. Problem is, there's no good device level information there. I know it's it's, it's an unsatisfying answer. I can't point you to a, a tool that works right now, but. We're, we're going to have to start seeing more of these tools come into play. No, that's a good answer. So I think we're running out of time. So we'll take a, a question from audience. If anyone has a question, please uh, go ahead. We'll take two questions. So it's all right. <laughs> I'm first. It's all right. Okay. OK, two questions. I have two questions. <laughs> no, OK. You can have one question. OK, so um, on, a, on, a, on an iPhone or Android phone, um, how does it? Let's say I have Wi-Fi and, and LTE. How does an app, or how does the OS, or maybe different depending on the platform, choose which method to connect? You know, it used to be pretty safe bet that you know if you had Wi-Fi, that's probably going to be better a way for your app to connect or the browser. Um, you know, I think Ilya, it sounds like you're at home. It sounds like LTE may be a better way for your phone to, to connect. They have better latency or bandwidth or both. Um, so what what's this? State of that with the with the platforms. How much is that is in the in the app today, and how much is the platforms, and where is that going? Um, second question is about buffer bloat on mobile, but I'll actually, we'll take it as second question. <laughs> I'll let you answer the first one. So the short answer is there's actually not a lot. So there's a lot of research going on to that field right now. As far as I'm aware, both Android and iOS, if you have Wi-Fi enabled, will prefer Wi-Fi. So there is very I'm not aware of any cases where the platform will use both. Uh, that said, um, Apple uh, has published some data around you know, the fact that they're working on MTCP, so multipath TCP. Um, and I believe they've actually enabled that in the kernel now. As far as I know, it's only used in a very specific use case, like the parking lot problem, which the idea being you have Wi-Fi, you're walking inside of your house, it's hanging on by a thread, it sucks, but it's not willing, the, your phone is not willing to switch over to LTE or whatever, right? So they're trying to solve that by being able to use both radios. I know that the Android team is also looking at this in depth and trying to figure out, uh, can we use both radios, right? So the downside to that is, of course, energy use. That's a big concern. Uh, but there's been good research, actually. Stanford has published a couple of good papers on this where they've, they've um, done tests where they just kind of roam around campus and they use both radios and actively switch them on and off and they actually show that that would deliver like a 30% energy decrease so it's really interesting but right now it, it is a problem because we have trained users to go in and explicitly enable or disable Wi-Fi this is dumb I think everybody realizes that now hopefully in a couple of years time we'll have a better solution for it but then actually, let me just add here, both iOS and Android do provide API calls to access the, uh, the Wi-Fi and the radio characteristics, which is the current level of RSSI on the Wi-Fi or the current uh, bar condition. So for example, you could be on a Wi-Fi but a poor RSSI, but on a good LTE or a good 4G. It uh, doesn't need to be LTE per se. But in, in that situation, the app could be doing something smarter. Uh, however, there's, of course, very limited control as well because there's a basic assumption today that if there's Wi-Fi, use Wi-Fi. No, but actually on that, so I'm, I'm, I'm going into the anecdotal side where in, in the app purify office in one conference room, Wi-Fi sucks and LTE is better, so I always turn off Wi-Fi when I go into it. <laughs> what can you, like, just tactically, what can an app developer do? How do, how do they use that API? Uh, so I believe yeah. from an app developer's perspective, using uh, using the data transfer API of the underlying OS is is basically going to be the same. I think at an OS level, there's going to be some level of smarts that has to be introduced. Of course, the app cannot go and turn off Wi-Fi explicitly, but what the OS needs to do is figure out which uh, radio is smarter, uh, which connectivity is uh, better, and then turn on those, turn on that radio and use it. Can there be like smart tips or something on the on the UI side that's saying, hey, your Wi-Fi kind of sucks. Why don't you do you want to try turning it off? So I am not familiar enough with the iOS API. I am not, but I'm not, I don't think there's a way to tell, use that radio when you open this connection. I know for sure that there is no such thing on the Android side. No, no, it's not about using a specific connection, it's determining the signal strength. 
But okay, great. You know the signal strength. Now right. what? There's only a recommendation that you can give at this point. Oh, I see. So okay. kind of prompt the user to say, hey, yeah. go disable your Wi-Fi. What needs to be done is that it's not the app developer or the app that can make any changes other than giving advice to the user to right. do a specific thing. The changes have to happen in the OS layer, yes. the operating system, where it needs to, it has a full handle on the drivers for both the RAN and the Wi-Fi, and it needs to enable one of them as a chief uh, method of transport. Uh, when yeah, I completely agree. So the long-term solution here is not to expose this data to the to even the app developer. It's actually for the platform to handle it. The exactly. platform should be smart enough to say. I will fail over to that connection. I will just migrate this connection over here and all the rest. And uh, just to bring back the conversation to something like quick, right? Like some of the protocols that we have today actually make that very hard. TCP ties itself to a, a port address uh, tuple, right? Which makes it very hard for me to just take packets from one connection, shuttle them over another. Basically, it's impossible. Things like quick try to solve that by introducing kind of the subtraction with a, a session ID such that we can just send data over any connection, or both even at the same time. Yes, yeah. just, just, sorry, one last thing on that, and apologies. Just tactically though, like super short term, I, I, I started seeing a few apps where they keep track of, the, they keep track of basically uh, uh, speed uh, over the last X minutes, and uh, they actually say, hey, we see, it looks like your, your network speeds really drop, you might want, it's gonna take a little longer. Again, think about it from the customer perspective on this. Just even that responsiveness is. Um, so that kind of leads to the general question of things like, you know, what does Android provide me? Um, leads to my question, which is, you know, we're talking mostly about app layer, app layer tools right now. We're often limited by the plumbing underneath. Either the AT and T, Verizon of the world, what information controls they provide us. The Qualcomm of the world, what you know, information controls they provide us, and the Androids, iOS people of the world. So, so my question is, so if you had sort of the one wish, right? Okay, now I can ask one of these people to do add one control, one API. Which one would it be, and what? You know, if there's something that's really limiting you in terms of the underlying plumbing, in terms of good app development, in terms of performance. So, I think it's already in progress, so that that, that kind of fulfills my wish, but to abstract this connection management. Uh, today, we don't really have that. I want the Qualcomm's of the world to expose APIs, which by the way, they have. They just hide them in their own drivers, uh, and they don't, and they charge big, uh, big sums of money to get access to those drivers. So uh, that, makes it, that makes it a hurdle. So getting access to data like, what is the energy use? What is the state of the radio? So even when, you, when I talk to the Android platforms team, right, and I, and I bring this up, they're like, yeah, we'd love to do this. The drivers don't give us information. Right? So it's like it's a stack three layers deep, or many more layers, actually. So they're, so they're trying to kind of bubble that information up at that point, they will be able to provide some extra APIs. So I think it'll happen. Unfortunately, it's just going to take, like, I, I wish this was a problem that was solved two years ago. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for folks who have asked questions, please don't forget to get your goodies there. And uh, Manish, awesome. uh, thank you so much for...